started filming. We're rolling. Oh, we're rolling. We always do a soft so roll. Might as well. Soft roll. <laughs> well, we might as well have a mic correctly. Um, what's he thinking? Um, Occasional writing. Oh, yeah. Um, I think, you know, I see a lot now in a certain form of particular, say, kind of internet inflected writing. Uh, there's a sort of, we're in this weird split between the kind of moment of the think piece, which I find really horrible, yeah. <laughs> where like it's supposed to map, as if the most recent episode of True Detective is supposed to kind of be an imperative towards thought, right? Or even the fact that it's only like, what? Wh who would review a book chapter by chapter? Precisely, so, <laughs> yeah, so A, there's that, yes, this very weird piece, piecemeal logic, but there's also, I think, this strange sense that, and I see this especially as someone who kind of still, you know, writes on, on film a fair amount of the time, is that there's this, strange idea that we're reviewers in some way and that it matters that you know I have an opinion about the 10 best films of the year no. or the like and the fact is that for me and I think for a lot of people that doesn't remotely correspond to the experience of time and historical time that I have with cinema mm. right I mean for me a sort of 1933 pre-code melodrama is in a way sort of as present as something that I go and see because they're kind of I'm going to torrent both of them, yeah, right? right? And there's a sort of immediacy of the copy, which is sort of an obsession through a lot of my work. I mean, obviously, the violent X is in a sense about this problem of copying and sort of historical flattening. But yeah. it's all just the occasional writing, I think, is one way for me to try to think of avoiding, you know, either the think piece or something that only waits, uh, like, for book scale, right? Oh, yeah, so yeah. So I'm sort yeah. of interested in this sort of in-between... Um, <laughs> so how did you uh, decide to work with Taku on? Taku and I met in Well, I should say before we even get into that, what yeah. did you think of last night's performance? To be honest, I couldn't see Yeah, I anything. heard a lot of people said that. So, uh, I mean, uh, I obviously think Taku is brilliant. That's why we're working together. Yeah. Um, but I couldn't really see. I would have loved to. There were sort of glimmers of this shadow play that I would have loved to see. But, you know, honestly, I couldn't see. Well, I'm wondering because a few people say that. And I mean, there's some of his, his recorded works that are performative, but you don't see it. Yeah, so, like, I was thinking about. It might be, but I've seen uh, a different iteration of a sort of box performance. Okay. And that was. There was a sort of uh, threat to visibility in that as well, but it was very different. It was staged where we met in Glasgow. We were both at this festival, uh, this thing called Arika yeah. there. Uh, doing, he was doing a performance and I was doing a sort of lecture performance, sort of hybrid thing. And the version he did of it there was quite remarkable because it was set in this long sort of stage space where there was, we were all sitting almost in bleachers mm. with a large gap between this and it was this, very interesting kind of dusk half light you can't um, make out, which is actually in a way I think why he and I became friends and collaborators, mm. is this obsession with not sort of blackness but gray as sort of a fundamentally more interesting concept of horror. Mm. But you know, he had this sort of remarkable half light and what's so interesting is this, um, the number of boxes huge, sort of look like 100 or something like that, and in this light it took on the character of a sort of planetary city, this sort of enormous sort of geotraumatic, as people say, mm. scale. Uh, and you couldn't actually tell if it was him moving through. It looked at times as if there was someone scaling a rope, and then you realize it's sort of, as far as I know, these sort of sandbags kind of attached to ropes as if sort of bodies looming through and knocking it down. So that was, I was really blown away by that performance, and that's why I was sort of, Decided to work with him, and then you know the more practical reason is we have a love of the same sort of pulpy sci-fi, and John Carpenter is a major touch point for us, both in a really kind of serious way. Um, a novel that I wrote recently sort of hijacks Snake Plissken from Escape from New York and transposes it to him at 73 years old and relatively senile and sent back to. Venice have just been turned into a maximum security prison, just trapping all the tourists there overnight without warning. And he's sent in one more time. So I think for both Taku and I, we have a strange straddling, maybe not that strange, between um, broadly speaking experimental traditions, although I have a, I don't find that word very useful, mm. but 
so to speak, kind of experimental traditions, and then sort of pulp and um, you know Z grade cinema and things like that. I mean, a lot of the the film work you know that I'm doing now and Violent X is a real product of. I think is an attempt to join sort of two senses of the idea of paracinema, of the paracinematic, yep. right? On the one hand, there's there's sort of um, older sense of it emerging is that, which is, let's say, kind of linked to certain forms of structuralist filmmaking or expanded cinema and attention to the kind of apparatus that surrounds the spectacle of cinema. But then there's the version that you get people like Joan Hawkins picking up, which is, right, that sort of trash aesthetics and that which is on the kind of margins mm. of the official film industry. And in a way, yeah, this film is an attempt to think about paracinema, but through a kind of different register, which has much more to do with, let's say, the kind of actual structures and circuits through which the cinema has happened mm. right over the course of a century. And so this is why it is... Uh, set in this particular moment using these particular source films, um, 1973 to 1977, roughly about a hundred films in this subgenre. What the Italians call a filone, mm. means like a thread or a, a vein. I think in an interesting way, like mining. So you kind of mine the vein until mm. it's gone. And you know what it basically was. This one's called the Plizio Teschi, the the cop films, and. Uh, you have very low budget, low scale producers who often lasted only one film where they get a bit of Turkish co-production money. And, you know, this was during an era where working class viewership of cinema in the theater was really hemorrhaging, right? Like by 1977, mm. only 17% of uh, all working class women in Italy had gone to the cinema even once in the last year. Right, so there's this real sense of like a kind of devastation of that being a kind of public, kind of communal experience. Uh, and these films, in a way, are this sort of desperate attempt by these small producers to cash in on what remains of that on these sort of vanishing spaces. Hmm. So that's the sort of, in a sense, the kind of fundamental material, um, both the visual that this is drawn from, consists of about 5,500 stills, kind of individually gathered and then uh, reanimated uh, from this one very tight cycle of film. Hmm.